So, astrodynamics. Astrodynamics is the science that studies motion of objects in space. What's a near-Earth orbit? Imagine all these objects orbiting the planet. Well, how, ma how many of these objects are we really talking about? About 500,000 objects, ranging from the size of a speck of paint all the way to the size of a school bus, are orbiting the Earth at different altitudes, crossing each other's paths. Half a million objects. Now, if you look at the number of objects, say, 10 centimeters, size of a softball and larger, now you're talking about 26,000, roughly. So, down to a millimeter, speck of paint, half a million. If you look at the uh, size of a softball and larger, talking about 26,000. So, part of the bad news is that <laughs> indeed, indeed, absolutely, yeah. Got it. So, part of the bad news, right, is that the only objects that are currently tracked are those 26,000. The rest of the objects that go to about half a million are like random bullets. We just hypothesize that these things exist, but we can't track these things. Okay, so whatever we put up there, it's who knows you know, how these things are gonna get impacted by these random bullets. Now, I say speck of paint, and you might be wondering, well, all right, speck of paint, how harmful can that sort of thing be? Well, how harmful can a bullet be, right? I mean, it's very small, it's moving at very high speeds. Now imagine that speck of paint moving at about 10 times the speed of a bullet. That's what we're talking about, okay? If that hits a satellite that's working, bad things can occur as a result of that. So 26,000 things that are being tracked, but the news gets a little bit worse because out of that 26,000 know, objects that we track, only about 2,000 actually work. What? <laughs> that's like, so, we only track about 1% of the stuff that can be harmful. And out of that 1%, only about 6% works and everything else is junk. That's what we're doing to our space environment, polluting it. Where does this stuff come from? All right, so many decades ago, Soviet Union launched Sputnik. There was a space race, humans to the moon and we kept on putting more and more objects, and as it turns out, most of the stuff that we put up never comes back. Yeah. Basically, it's like, you know, you go camping, leave all your trash there, and then come back camping a couple weeks later, bring more trash. You can kind of see where this is going. It's becoming a real big problem. Now, the other thing, too, is that not only are we putting stuff there, and basically, you know, abandon it once the fuel runs out, we just send up something else. Every once in a while, things explode on their own, okay? So big things explode and become smaller things. Every once in a while, things collide with each other and become smaller things, okay? And every once in a while, you'll have somebody that blows something up on purpose, which happened just a few days ago, actually. So. Uh, India decided to demonstrate how awesome they are in space and blew up something in a low Earth orbit where most of the pieces will come back, but some of the stuff won't come back for a while, and it's a hazard to operational objects. We probably don't want to encourage that sort of behavior. So where's this stuff at and why? It turns out that giving, given the uh, curvature of space-time, there are some Goldilocks regions perfect places to put certain satellites. For instance, there is this uh, highway that we call the geosynchronous orbit. And that highway is at, at about you know, 36,000 kilometers from the Earth's surface. It's about six Earth radii. Radius of the Earth equatorial is about 6,378.147 kilometers, give or take. <laughs> um, anyway, so 
the interesting thing is that that's where communication satellites are ideal to be placed because just like with uh, DirecTV, you know, you, you have your dish mounted on the side of your house, you point it, you don't want to touch it again. And it turns out that the satellite from a uh, perspective of somebody on the ground stays in the same place. So it takes about 24 hours for these objects to go once around their orbit. That highway, if it becomes polluted to the point where you can't use it anymore, that's a problem for anybody that relies on communications. And guess what? A lot of us do. So there's these regions. So think these three-dimensional regions like shells, highway shells, where we can put things and take advantage of Mother Nature. And if we have to utilize another mechanism that fights against nature, well, that's bad news. Okay, So we want to avoid that. So what's the other bit of bad news? Well, we don't have any traffic rules for things in space. None. No traffic rules for stuff in space. So let me get this straight. Put something up there and kind of do whatever you want. You got it. It's like no man's land up there. Basically, launch, behave any way you like. There are no rules for traffic in space. So on the ground, in your car, you can see that there is a red light. Hopefully you stop. Hopefully you know what to do. Okay. Uh, on the oceans, we have ways to know when to turn left or right if we see another oncoming ship. Right? In the air, it's similar. In space, nothing. No traffic rules in space. That, that's worrisome. More bad news. There is no globally accessible, shared, common lake of information that people can draw from to try to operate safely and keep the environment long-term sustainable. Okay? So, and I'm going to give you an example of this. The U.S., the Department of Defense, has the largest publicly available catalog, about 16,000 objects thereabouts. But the Russians have their own catalog, the Chinese have their own, the Europeans have their own, the Germans have this, that, okay? Everybody has their own, but there's no combined set of information, okay? That is an issue as well. Do people care about this? Yes. In fact, the United Nations has a Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, and they just, when I say they, I mean like 90 countries by consensus, adopted these guidelines for long-term sustainability. Okay? So they care. And, and fortunately, uh, I was brought on to the US delegation to the UN, and uh, in fact, just uh, in February, that's the last time that we met to talk about science and technology needs. And so there are these guidelines, but OK, who implements this stuff? How do you enforce anything? There's no, there's no traffic rules. There's no enforcement. There's no space cops, for sure. Could be a thing, but you know that doesn't exist yet. And in terms of you personally, well, put it this way. Uh, position, navigation, and timing services, right? Location services, I think all of us use that. When I drive my vehicle, I like using Waze. Waze is pretty cool. Helps me avoid uh, traffic jams and that sort of stuff. So, you know, if, if all of a sudden global navigation satellite systems, if, if those went away, you'd lose that. But those keep track of planes. They keep track of boats. They keep track of lots of stuff. So that would be a detrimental thing. All right, how about something a little bit more egocentric? I love soccer. I love to watch Leo Messi play. I got to tell you, when I'm watching El Clasico, if, eh, any El Clasico fan? Okay. When I'm watching, when I'm watching soccer, I do not want to be interrupted. If, if all of a sudden that signal goes away, I get angry. It's, it's bad news. We've become so intolerant to this stuff because we want information on demand. That's what we want, and that's what people are hearing. Information on demand, on tap. You know, every once in a while, I'll have the fortune to go overseas for a conference or something, and I'll 
go to the small town someplace, maybe, you know, northern Italy or something. I'll go to an ATM, and I expect to get cash out. Well, what happens when you go to the ATM and nothing happens? Pfft, not so good. Okay? Turns out you can't just wash dishes and get your way out of stuff. You know, you need cash. And so there are satellites that route banking information and transactions. How about things like weather? Warnings that tell you days in advance you might really consider evacuating because bad stuff's going to happen, right? <laughs> These are critical services and capabilities. There's nothing protecting this stuff from one second to the next, okay? So what's the probability that any of these things are going to disappear at any instant? Okay, low, but I just told you, things are, there's more and more stuff being populated. All right. Safety and sustainability. We really want to make space transparent and predictable. If we can make space transparent and predictable, that's a good thing. All right? You're talking about how do objects behave? You need to be able to predict where something's going to be in the future so you can move out of the way. But it's not just junk and how to junk behave. It's also the stuff that people control. I got to tell you, if you want to be able to predict how Americans behave in space, we maneuver our satellites on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Okay? We don't do it on Fridays because if the thing doesn't work, you don't want to stay at work later. Certainly don't want to come in on weekends and holidays, and definitely don't want to do it on a Monday when you just chilled out at home, ah, oh, wow, I got to come in and work and do this? No. So Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday are the day that Americans typically move their objects in space. That's an American culture thing. Do the Indians have to do that? Do the Russians, the Chinese? No. So we have to apply a cultural lens, some cultural competency, to predict how people from different cultures are going to behave in any given situation. So what if we had a system that could globally monitor all this stuff, right? Well. I've got something for you. Ta-da! <laughs> it's this thing called Astrograph, and we developed it here at the University of Texas at Austin. You can just go, bring it up on your cell phone right now. Okay, not now, just wait. <laughs> and you can see it. And this is a combined set of information from like six to eight different sources. And this is about 26,000 things, okay? Different colors, and I won't explain all the color schemes right now, but all these dots are things that humans put on orbit. But hold on, Mariba. What about, what do the Americans believe is in space? Well, if you had to see that ring, there's the geo ring there in the background. This is what the Department of Defense publicly says is in space. Okay, what if I ask the Russians? Wow, that's, that looks kind of different, right? <laughs> so this is what I'm talking about. They don't all agree with each other. So that's an issue. So what can we do as academics? We are trying to create the Hogwarts of space here at UT, where through transdisciplinarity we can say law students, engineers, physicists can all come together and take the dark arts class. <laughs> and we can really understand the pains and woes of each other. And the next person that goes and legislates knows what a telescope looks like. The next astronomer knows, hey, it's not easy to achieve consensus and multilateral discussions. This is what we need. We need more transdisciplinarity. So astrograph. It's a way to combine all these sources of information and demonstrate to humanity that there is a way to be transparent and hopefully move towards predictability. Thank you very much.